Hi everyone, this is Harsh and today we are going to learn about the Black-Scholes-Merton option pricing model. So let's get started. We are going to focus on understanding the intuition behind this model rather than the math as uh, I'm trying to make this model easier to understand for people who are not that familiar with let's say calculus. So let's get started without any delay. Uh, before knowing the black scholes merton model, is, it is essential to understand what a normal distribution is. So, what I'm talking of is basically this. Now, this is a, what you call a bell-shaped curve. How this curve is actually formed? So, let's say you take a stock, okay? Let's say you take a stock and uh, you collect the data for the last 10 years, okay? Or maybe more maybe greater than 10 years okay so then you find out whatever is the average return and then you simply go ahead and plot this so according to a theory which is known as the central limit theorem i'll not go into detail of what the central limit theorem is if you take the data for a large number of years for in stock returns and you plot it you'll get a bell-shaped curve where this point this point is the average now what is this line this is nothing but the frequency so it is obviously intuitive right because high, the highest frequency will be for the average return the, meaning let's say the average return is let's say 10 percent so on for most of the years let's say this was 100 okay so for most of the years you will be noticing an annual return of 10 percent and for very you know some of the years the return will be let's say a plus 50 percent so that's why you see the frequency is quite low and for some of the years the return will be say let's say minus 50 percent but on average the return is 10 percent so the central limit theorem states that the probability on the left side of the curve is 50 percent and on the right side of the curve is 50% and this also makes intuitive sense right like uh, if we are in the middle let's say the average return 10% there's a 50% probability that the return will be more than 10% 50% probability that the return will be less than 10% okay so this is what central limit theorem says and this is what uh, is the normal distribution so in the black scholes merton model what we are using is the standard normal distribution okay it's called standard normal distribution now why it is known as standard normal distribution basically let's say again taking the same example the average return is let's say 10 percent and let's say you calculated the standard deviation to be five percent now let's say in any given year if i get a return of 15 percent okay and how far is that from the average in terms of the standard deviation this is nothing but 1 right 15 minus 10 5 5 percent by 5 percent is 1 so the standard normal distribution is nothing but the the bell curve this is scaled as per this is scaled to the standard deviation so 0 and let's say over here you have one standard deviation let's say over here you have two standard deviation over three here you have minus one minus two and minus three so what does this mean this is the average return zero is 10 percent right how let's say if i re replace this 15 percent with 10 percent itself this whole figure will be zero right so zero is 10 percent this one one indicates what a return of how much 15 percent so 15 percent is a return that is one standard deviation away one standard deviation away from the mean mean or average so i hope you understood this concept of what a standard normal distribution is it is just scaled in terms of the standard deviation now we have a concept called z table okay around this now what is a z table let's see that so first let us understand what a z score is z score is nothing but x minus mu divided by standard deviation x was 15% mu 
uh, this is denoted as this yeah mu was 10 percent and standard deviation was 5 percent so we got the z score as 1 now let's understand what is the significance of this z score if i go and look at a z table over here so i have a z table open if i see we have got a z score of 1 right so 1.00 0, 1.00 the probability assigned to that score is 0 0.8413 let's say if we had a score of z score of 1.04 so we would look at 1.0 over here and 0 0.04 over here so that would be 0 0.8485 but currently the probability assigned to us is 0 0.8413 now what does this 0 0.8413 actually signify let's talk about that so let's say this is your standard normal distribution and currently we are at this point 1 we are at this point this area this entire area this is the probability of 84.13 percent or whatever you can write it as 0 0.8413 okay so now let's start with the black scholes martin model first i'm going to simply write the formula of the call option so in this video we'll be learning from the perspective of a call option c0 indicates that the value of the call option at t equals to 0 means today itself okay this is equal to s0 into n of d1 okay minus x e to the power of minus r t multiplied by n of d2 to simplify things s is nothing but the current stock price and x is nothing but the strike price and n d1 and n d2 you can refer to d1 as z score 1 and this as z score 2 and we have already discussed what is z score is so i need not explain this again now if this is clear let's go ahead and expand the formula even more So C0 is nothing but S0 into N of now let's see what D1 exactly is. D1 is nothing but the log of S by X plus the risk free rate plus the standard D plus the variance divided by 2 this all multiplied by T okay and yeah divided by standard deviation of root t okay this is the first part of the equation minus x of e to the power of minus rt into n of log s by x plus rf minus variance by 2 into t standard deviation root t so if you see the only difference between n d1 and n d2 is basically this here you are subtracting the variance and here you are adding the variance now kindly note down this formula somewhere now let's tackle with the complex part of the formula that is n d1 and n d2 because if these n d1 and n d2 were not there the formula would be simply s minus x and yeah this e power of minus rt will deal with that later but we all know what is s minus x that is simply by how much the option is in the money at expiry at expiry itm in the money we are talking about a call option right so at expiry let's say the stock was at 10 and the strike price was at 5 so 5 rupees in the money and the value of the option is also 5 rupees value of the option as well because there is no time left we are already ex expiry so the value of the option is simply s minus x so we all know this so let me just interrupt this now for the sake of simplicity let's assume let's assume that rf is equal to 0 standard deviation is equal to 0 and the stock is currently at the money which means s equals to x all right 
so we have, we have three assumptions over here first of all we are assuming there is free rate to be zero the standard deviation or the variance to be zero and the stock price is equal to the strike price meaning the stock is at the money currently so let's see what happens in that case to the formula okay let's see what change happens to the formula now let's say the stock is at 10 rupees and the strike price is also at 10 rupees so i can write it as 10 into n of now note that this entire thing because the standard deviation is itself zero this entire thing will become zero as well okay and minus again x is also 10 e to the power of minus zero is nothing but one into this entire thing as well will become zero what i had told was this is nothing but your z score okay this is nothing but your z score these both are the z scores for a z score of zero for a z score of zero in the standard normal distribution how much was this area 50 percent right so if i have to value the option in a world where the risk-free rate is zero and let's say the standard deviation is zero and the stock price is equal to strike price what will be the answer 10 into 50 percent minus 10 into 50 percent which is simply zero now the insight that we get from all of this what we have done till now is basically let's say if the stock is at 10 right now okay the stock price is at 10 the strike price is also 10 and let's say the seller tells you that boss this stock is not gonna move anywhere because volatility is zero right the stock like will you be willing to pay even a single rupee for this call option the seller is saying that this volatility is itself zero so i am not a fool to pay for something that doesn't even move so there's almost because i'll feel like there's a zero probability that this thing will go in the money so why should i pay anything for this option right so this makes intuitive sense also and this can be mathematically derived as well that what we can conclude from this is in the absence in the absence of volatility in the absence of volatility the option is simply worthless correct this can be we have mathematically derived it so this is this is why it is said that more the volatility greater the volatility this is why it is said greater the volatility greater will be the option price see volatility is always a, an options friend all right so assuming that we have understood this let's move further okay so we saw that when uh, volatility is equal to zero and our option is uh, basically our stock is at the money that is the stock price is equal to strike price the option is basically worthless because if something doesn't move then why will i pay for it right so now i'm going to tweak my assumption a little bit i'm going to say that there is volatility equal to standard deviation itself now let's see how our formula changes now okay i'm gonna rewrite the formula one second i'm just uh, yes so i'm gonna rewrite the formula s0 into n of log s by x rf is 0 so directly it will come to variance by 2 t is equal to 1 okay this is a new assumption that we have t equals to 1 here so as to simplify okay this divided by standard deviation root of 1 is 1 okay so this is the first equation x into e to the power of minus r r is 0 t is 1 so again this whole term is equal to 1 itself into n of log of s by x okay plus uh, i mean minus variance by 2 again t is equal to 1 so standard deviation and there you close now we had assumed that s equals to x and we had taken the s and x value as 10 respectively right so let me just change it to that simply so log of 10 by 10 okay and here also log of 10 by 10 now if uh, you have steady logarithms 
there's a property of logarithm which says log 1 is equal to 0 all right so this becomes simply n of variance by 2 divided by the variance minus x of into minus variance by 2 divided by the variance and we know that s and x are both the same right s and x are both the same so can i write it this way 10 into i take open my bracket n of variance by 2 divided by variance minus n of minus variance by 2 divided by the variance okay so I'm, I'll, I'll be continuing this on this on the next page so if you want to note it kindly note it till here okay so we were at this stage right now as you all know i already told you that this is nothing but the z score okay okay this is nothing but the z score now if you remember the standard normal distribution the middle point was zero this was plus one this was plus two this was minus one this was minus two minus three and so on now just tell me one thing for a positive z score the area under the curve is this much okay and for a negative for a negative z score let's say minus one the area under the curve is only this much so over here if you can see 10 into this entire thing this is a positive z score okay and this entire thing this is a negative z score we got that right so obviously this will have a higher probability let's say 60 percent i'm just taking any random figure you have to look at the z table to get the actual prob probability and this will have a lower probability let's say around 30 percent so 10 into 30 percent that finally comes to 3 rupees which is the option price when the option was atm that is s equals to x okay now let's try and understand what is happening over here at the very beginning of the video i told that volatility is an options friend but volatility can be an options enemy as well right because an in the money option can go out of the money as well due to increased volatility so if you see this equation this was your reward and this was your cost now increased volatility can definitely increase your reward okay so the seller of the option will tell you see boss the volatility is high so i need increased premium from you okay but you can counter the selling seller saying that i understand that the volatility is high and it can help my option get in the money but it can also it can also lead to my option getting out of the money so due to the fact that increased volatility can get my option out of the money i want a cost reduction so you will have to be compensated for the fact that the increased volatility can get your option out of the money you're already paying for increased volatility over here right you're already paying over here see this 60 percent is what you're paying already but you have to be compensated also right because this increased volatility can make your option otm that is worthless so you have to find a balance okay you you can't charge for one-sided volatility only there has to be a balance so that's why this is the average okay so this is three rupees now i hope you got this concept very uh, you understood this concept clearly because what we did till now was first we assumed that volatility was zero okay when volatility was zero the option was worthless option was worthless now the option is at i mean the stock is at the money but there is a certain amount of volatility so the option has some value option has some value okay in this case three rupees so what are we paying for the first component we are paying for is volatility that we clearly understood now let's come on to this second component 
s by x now we both we know that this s by x is included in nd2 as well and nd1 as well so this is also part of the cost as well as the reward that you're getting how so we are already paying for volatility right let's assume this rf to be zero we are paying for volatility what else do you think you pay for when you are purchasing an option what about if that option if that option that you are purchasing is already in the money at this particular point will you be only paying for volatility only paying for volatility answer this if the option is already in the money will you be only paying for volatility no right why because the option carries intrinsic value right this option carries the intrinsic value as well so how do you know that the option is in the money as well if you look at this log s by x this is a ratio of the stock price to the strike price if let's say this ratio this ratio is greater than 1 okay what does this say this say this that the stock is already in the money so you have to pay for the volatility plus the fact that now that the stock is in the money the option price the option price will move as per the delta once the stock is in the money for every one rupee increase in the stock price the option price will move as per the delta delta is simply the sensitivity of the option price to the increase in stock price if let's say the delta is 0.8 okay if let's say the delta is 0.8 that means for every one rupee increase in the stock price the option will move by 0.8 so you are paying you are already paying for volatility now that the option is in the money you have to pay for delta as well so we already saw that one we are paying for volatility two we are paying for delta now some of you might be confused that volatility we are adding over here and we are subtracting over here now we know the reason because this is a double edged sword okay this is a double edged sword it has its advantages as well as disadvantages so you have to add it because it helps in increasing your reward as well and you have to be compensated for it as well okay now delta has a positive value in both nd1 and nd2 why because this is a neutral attribute let's try and understand this let's say the stock price is at 10 and let's say the exercise price was as 5 now the stock price has increased by 5 but it's not yet expiry okay so it's there is time to expiry and let's say the delta is 0.8 so 4 now this 4 rupees this is increasing your reward as well at the same time someone who comes to purchase the option now will have to pay this 4 rupees so you can see this is a neutral attribute this is increasing both the reward as well as the cost but in case of volatility that's a double edged sword okay volatility helps in increasing your reward but volatility also increases the chances that your option might go out of the money okay so you need to be compensated for that also for delta that's a neutral attribute okay both the buyer and the seller buyer means the person who is all seller means the person who is right now already in the option so he's already enjoying this four rupees profit at the same time someone who comes to purchase the option will have to pay this four rupees right so that's why delta has a positive value in both of n of d1 as well as n of d2 okay so i hope we understood uh why delta has a positive value in both of these equations So let's talk about the risk free rate now if you ask you if i ask you a simple question that if you purchase an option what is your least expectation like what is the least that you can expect you can expect to earn the risk free rate at least otherwise why will i go ahead and purchase an option i expect to earn the risk free rate plus extra return above over and above the risk free rate so this extra return this is nothing but represented by this standard deviation in this first component the reward component okay 
so that's why you'll have to factor in the risk rate again it's another neutral attribute right you have to factor this in in your reward as well because you expect to earn this and plus you will be charging for it as well right because let's say if you're earning the risk free rate over here let's say i am earning the risk free rate okay on some instrument uh, let's say there's an fd okay which gives you let's say what 108 after one year after one year okay and you want to purchase that fd today and the rate going on is eight percent okay so what will you pay for it today 108 divided by 1.08 right how much that is 100 correct so obviously this has to be accounted in both the cost as well as the reward okay because i am expecting to earn the at least the risk free rate and when i sell the option to anybody else the buyer also expects to earn the at least the risk free rate over the time period of the option and pays accordingly for the option so again this is a neutral attribute so this is why the risk free rate is added both in n1 as well as n2 okay next now let's come to what is e so we know for a fact that p into 1 plus r to the power of t is a okay let's say t is equal to one year itself okay so i do semi-annual compounding six months i get an a this a will be slightly higher than this a because the number of compounding periods have increased let's say i do quarterly compounding this a will be again slightly higher than a as the number of compounding periods have again increased remember that the time period is one year only we are just dividing it into four quarters so the, num the number of compounding is four times so there will be a minute difference but this a will be the highest similarly if what i'll now i'll do is i'll compound this infinite times so remember this property if this term this particular term is called e to write it a little formally limit as x tends to infinity 1 plus 1 by x to the power of x is nothing but e okay you can plug in any r value over here to demonstrate that as well let's say you have limit as n tends to infinity okay p into 1 plus r by n to the power of n okay t is let's say 1 itself t is 1 year only so we are just dividing 1 year into infinite parts and compounding it infinite times okay so now we will assume that x a variable x is equal to n by r so this equation will then become p into 1 plus 1 by x to the power of x will be n will be rx so to the power of r x this can be rewritten as p into 1 plus 1 by x to the power of x whole to the power of r and we already know limit as x tends to infinity this equation 1 plus 1 by x to the power of x is e so the inside of the bracket we can write this as e to the power of r which is simply p into e to the power of r so i'm just uh, rubbing this over here so as we now have understood what is e exactly what can be e to the power of minus r that is nothing but 1 by e to the power of r so if this is compounding this is nothing but this is discounting why are we discounting the present value over here i mean sorry why are we discounting the strike price over here again it's common sense right you will be purchasing the option at the strike price somewhere in the future okay let's say if this is t0 you will be purchasing the option at the strike price at t equals to 1 but 
you are deciding the price of the option you are evaluating the option at t equals to 0 right so you have to bring this value back to its present value and black scholes model black scholes merton model assumes it assumes continuous continuous compounding so for that purpose we will be discounting it by e to the power of r okay so that's why this e is present over here simply to bring back the strike price or the cost to purchase the option at the present value so i hope uh, all the concepts have been clear the black scholes merton model is a complex one even if you have not understood the mathematical derivation of this formula it's important to understand the intuition behind it which i hope you got uh, from this video Thank you once again and see you next time.